tonight, we're going to talk about contemporary art, uh, which is a follow-on to last week, last month's discussion on modern art. And we'll learn that contemporary art is the art of today, the art of today's time frame. Typically, it's created by living artists. So when I asked the question of Dr. Google, why do we need to study contemporary art? Dr. Google said, studying contemporary art allows people to broaden their understanding of themselves, their community, and their world. It helps them become critical thinkers as they consider the influences that lead to the creation of each work of art, such as sociopolitical climate, the artist's training, and cultural influences. So tonight, I think you're going to see that Suzanne selected for us some of those um, thought-provoking pieces of art. Um, they might call forth some emotions in you, like joy or, or fear or anxiety, or maybe even disbelief, like, this is art, do people pay for this? That's what I felt at a couple of points. Um, but as always, it's, it's a journey in um, enlightenment, because Suzanne put so much work into this. So Suzanne, here is our mistress of ceremonies, and let me thank you in advance for the journey that we're taking together with our friends. Yeah. Thanks, Claudia. Well, as Claudia mentioned, we're, last time we did a mini dip into the modern art pool, and uh, that was from the 1860s to the 1970s, and tonight let's continue, as she said, with the art styles that emerged from that next period, which was contemporary art. And, you know, the modern art, um, Error took the artist seriously. It was the genius of the artist. And look what they could do. It's, it's just amazing. And contemporary art like pop art or minimalism or conceptual art, performance art, it's a social commentary. It's art that changed a viewpoint. Um, it's not so much about the brush strokes. It's more about the viewer's impression of the art. So, you know, contempt as Claudia said, contemporary art questions our concept of ethics. And is it art or isn't it? So, you know, what the heck is contemporary art? Um, why don't you go to the next slide? There we go. Some say, you know, nobody really knows when contemporary art era began. Uh, some people say it was in 1989 when the Berlin Wall uh, fell or Tiananmen Square when the protests were happening. Others said it was in the 70s when World War, or, or when World War II ended, or even in the 1910s when Marcel Duchamp bought a toilet in New York, signed his name and hung it in a gallery. Um, it makes defining the error, you know, the beginning of this error almost impossible. So that debate's been going on for years, and by the time we figure out when contemporary art period began, that error might already be over. So if you, um, you know, the, today the temp contemporary art comes in all mediums and sizes. It stretches from videos to objects to exhibits outside of museums to installations. We don't always agree uh, but, uh, um, on what it is, but it is the art of today. It is global. It is culturally diverse and eclectic, and it, it is. Um, there are dozens of art movements and styles, as you can see here. Uh, most I am not familiar with, uh, and, uh, and lots more. Uh, we don't always agree, but as Claudia said, they say that the art, artist is living, but it's not always the case in contemporary. They always do push the boundaries to express new ideas. Sometimes traditional mediums are done in new ways, and sometimes there are new mediums uh, done in, a in, in an old way, a traditional way. It's inclusive. It includes everything. Every artist, every thought, every medium, every concept. And that's the wonderful thing about contemporary art. Um, and like modern art, the... Uh, only more so the early contemporary artists laid the groundwork for today's artists and allowed them 
absolute freedom to look with different eyes and different thoughts at their world and experiment however they wanted to with whatever medium they want to use. So I'd like to start our tour tonight overlapping a bit with abstract impressionism. So we can go to the next slide, Claudia. Many think that the turning point from modern into contemporary art was with abstract impressionism. And in the 50s, the dominant artistic movement was abstract impressionism. And it was an anti-literal, anti-figurative movement that emphasized <laughs> a burst of motion, shape, and color on canvas as a visual metaphor for the artist's inner emotional state. And it didn't matter it was regard to the subject or the circumstance. So this piece by, Bay, pardon? I just want to say that I've muted everybody. So oh. if you want to engage, you'll have to unmute yourself because we were getting some background noise. And I think it's easier if, if you just control your own mic and unmute yourself when you, when you want to engage with Suzanne. So. Oh, that would be great. And I also want to encourage lots of questions and conversation. Or if you're scratching your head and going, huh, that's OK, too. All we ask of you when you're looking at this is to consider art. It's just to consider the piece. You don't have to like it. You don't have to dislike it. Just, just consider and, and be aware of what emotion it's, it's bringing up in you. So this is a piece by Paul Jenkins. And he celebrates this opulent color and this amazing optical experience that he started in the 60s, uh, before the 60s, but then he started moving away from oils and started experimenting with the new acrylic paints and then watercolors. And he started saturating his canvases and heavy papers that he was using and dynamically mixing and blending the color wheel. So, color wheel. so as you see here, he, he let the colors mix themselves. Yellow and dark blue mixed into green. The blue and the red you like you kind of mixed into a purple and the yellow and the and the red kind of mixed into this orange colors. But what was interesting is how he does his art. You want to go to the next one, Claudia? Jenkins was a big fan of Jackson Pollard, and he was a friend of Mark Rothko, who we saw a piece last uh, month, and they both of them greatly influenced his style. He started these phenomena pieces, what he calls phenomena pieces, in the 1960s, and as I said, they evolved from the oils and acrylics and then watercolors. What he does is he, he avoids the paintbrush altogether, and he instead allows the pigment to pool and bloom and roll across the surface of his canvases or, or, or heavy, heavy paper. He guides the paint with a knife to create, you know, these fluid fields of color. Um, this is probably where Claudia says, yes, my five-year-old could do this. <laughs> but it does take some skill. And so no, I, I could do this. I, you I could do. Oh, you I could do this. And <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> yes, you could. Yeah, I'm not necessarily sure it would come out looking similar to this. I mean, I think he's very thoughtful on where he places his colors and how he layers colors. Um, if I he told you he worked at a ceramics factory in his youth, that experience might. Uh, have in, have um, influenced his tactile methods of painting. So um, an interesting artist and the piece that's in the crocker that we just saw is very luminous and very alive. It is an absolutely jewel of a piece. So when you go back into the crocker, you can take a look at it. So that's... Um, so Andy, yeah, if you, Melissa. If you could go back to the painting. Yeah, go ahead. Go back, go back to the... To the yeah. yeah. The, the, the right-hand right side. Yeah, the right-hand side. Um, it almost looks like ceramic, right? I've seen pots that have that. Yeah, that glaze on it. That it, it's it's a very un, I don't, unique process that he does, and because he layers and pours and doesn't brush, it's almost like. A gloss that's put on and it's a very it's a very beautiful way of 
presenting. You think it would be big and globby and and like many of the abstract artists, and it, and it's not at all. It's this very luscious, smooth, and and velvety uh, finish on it. That's a pretty big piece, though. It's like four by eight. Is that? Yeah, it's 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 uh it yeah it's a it's a four by six. I think it's a good size. Yeah, it's a good size piece. Um, so let's talk about pop art. So when I say pop art, who do you usually think of first? Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, Peter Matt, absolutely. Well, um, we're going to talk about Mel Ramos. And pop art, it, it kind of presented a challenge to the traditions of fine art with this imagery from advertising and comic books and other bourgeois mass-produced items, including labels and logos. And, and while Mel Ramos never achieved the same level of fame as his fellow pop art pioneers, he was an important part of that first generation of American pop artists. His uh, superheroes and nudes uh, were exhibited alongside the work of Warhol and Lichtenstein and Oldenburg and Vesselman and, and even Wayne Tebow, who we know uh, previously is a Sacramento known artist. Um, he was best known, as you see here, for his female nudes painted next to brand logos featuring, uh, um, uh, you know, that were wrapped around giant soda bottles or popping out of candy wrappers or lounging on fresh fruit and other consumer products, uh, products like martini glasses. And, uh, and he continued to produce these works until his death. And uh, Claudia and I were talking earlier today, and the one on the right, the Coca-Cola, was done in 1968. The one on the left was 2012, the year of his death. Uh, and we both noticed that the hairstyles have changed a little bit. But really, the bodies haven't changed much. Is and that he, Lindsay Lohan on the left? Lindsay Lohan, yeah, possibly, Catherine. But we noticed that all, all the women are tanned, and they all have tan lines where their bathing suits were. So you can tell the one on the left was newer, has a thong. The one on the right was kind of a bikini looking. Um, anyway. You also uh, mentioned that he was a Sacramento artist. And yes, he was a Sacramento. He was native Sacramentan. And uh, he went to uh, Sacramento Junior College at the time, which is now City College. And he received his bachelor's and master's from Sac State. And then he went on to teach at the high school level and college levels. And... He spent the majority of his professional career teaching at um, CSU East Bay, which is in Hayward. And uh, he, he came to paint his pop art subjects, not only because they were contemporary, but he said after a half century of still lives by Picasso and Matisse, um, they, he felt they lacked authenticity. And he found inspiration in American TV and pulp media the real stuff, he called it, and he began painting his superheroes. So let's go to the next slide, Claudia. There we go. The Adam comic book character. In, you know, 1954, which uh, was McCarthy era, the comic industry bowed to con the congressional pressure, and they agreed to police itself, assuring that their stories would show crime and criminals to be punished and the goodwill triumph over evil. So in 1962, when Ramos painted the Adam, also known as the Mighty Might, uh, he painted it much in the tradition of, grand tradition of oil painting. These superheroes were still considered subversive and they felt they were still corrupting agents on America's youth. And Claudia and I were talking earlier and it's like, what's more American than comics, apple pie, and baseball? <laughs> so I think it's very interesting. Anyway, in this large canvas, the atom whose, whose power, the superhero, lay in his ability to diminish in size, even to the atomic level, he struggles against this carnivorous Venus flytrap. And, uh, what Mel Ramos did so beautifully is he played off of this concept of scale. So in it, his tiny specimen plays this monumental role. It's, it's huge. He's overpowering this little teeny plant, but he looks massive and gigantic. And um, 
he also painted uh, this this piece very flat. It's a it's a when you when you see it, it's uh, the colors are very flat, and that's very much like a comic book. But what he did a little differently is he handled um, his his detailing is very precise. So um, people say, well, why isn't Mel Ramos as famous? Well, part of it is is that a critic pointed out that in a lot of ways Mel was equal to the Lichtensteins and of course Andy Warhol's. The problem was that Andy Warhol left about thirty six thousand works of art when he, but by the time he died, Lichtenstein had more than five thousand. Mel Ramos hand painted everything. It was all he did not do uh, lithographs or posters or any other. Everything was an original. And he also had a full-time job teaching, and that left little time for making new work. In his, probably the best year, his most famous year was 1968, he left, he did about 18 to 20 works. So there are probably not even a thousand Ramoses in the world. And so he hasn't been widely co collected at all. But um, the Crocker actually has two of his. One is this one, and one is a nude which is right in center stage when you're touring the students in the contemporary gallery. So it's always an interesting um, way to uh, talk about nudes in the, in the gallery. Uh, anyway, let's move to another uh, contemporary concept and that's photorealism. It's also known as uh, hyperrealism or superrealism. And this was developed by a loosely affiliated group of American painters and sculptors who kind of reacted to post-war art and the pulp, the pop culture, uh, and, and, and the photography. And once again, art swings back and forth. They were rebelling against the pop artists who were rebelling against the realists. So it, 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 art changes constantly and there's always different movements happening and styles happening at the same time. So um, the, the photorealists wanted to portray objects with greater visual accuracy, and they relied mostly on photographs in their places, in, in their practice, and they often depicted uh, American motifs in their work. Um, sometimes they complicated these ideas of reality. They injected fantastical or abstract elements uh, in, into their usually very uh, precise works. But this artist, uh, Robert Bechtel, who was a native San Franciscan, um, he was known for his depictions of sunlit streets and everyday life. And um, he documented his family, friends, and automobiles and the architecture of San Francisco with watercolors and oil paint. He says that they're all things that he's noticed just living here and things that he sees on his walk in the morning or he's driving by and something jumps out and says, photograph me. Um, he started painting like many artists did after he graduated from the California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland uh, with his Masters of Fine Arts in the late 50s. And he, he was following the style of an artist he admired who was Richard Diepenkorn, who was a Bay Area figurative artist and very, and very post-impressionist um, who we saw uh, 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 last last month, I believe. Um, but during the 1960s, he kind of made a decisive step to produce paintings uh, based on photographs. And he used images that he shot himself. He traced that image onto the canvas, and then he began cropping and heightening the color or erasing unwanted detail, and did this very precisely. Now, in this particular one called French Doors 2, I want, it's very, very hard, just probably hard to see, but it's two canvases. And they, the canvases are split in the, in the middle of the doors. So one canvas is one door and the other canvas is the other door. So what he did was he explored his reflection that he caught by a photograph in these doors. And it's fascinating because he, Here's to occupy that space of the viewer where you'd be looking out at. And we look at his wife, Nancy, who's seated at the table. And uh, it's, it just enhances our perception that this is a real but not a, and not a virtual 
you know, not, not virtual space. And it's, it is a mesmerizing piece because you're looking at it and you're wondering, is it a photograph or is it, is it not? And he, Robert Bechtel was very, very precise in how he painted. Any, anybody have any questions or comments on this one? So that's him, image of him? Yes, that's an image of him and then his wife. So what you're seeing is the double reflection and it was probably caused by the French door on the left is slightly open. So you'll uh -huh. get that double reflection and like the double reflection of the light. You're getting those yeah. two forces. Interesting. Wow. It is a very interesting. All right. Now, Continue. I don't think it really looks the same in those pictures. He he does he does not does he? And that's his ability that he doesn't want an actual absolute copy. So he modifies, he modifies himself. Yeah. So he's shorter there on the, <laughs> on the left and on the right. And you know you don't know if that's the distortion of the reflection or how he chose to display it. Well, so. when you when you see it hung in the gallery, uh -huh. can you tell that there's two separate canvases? I mean, is it? Cause right no, you here, you actually have to walk up very close to see it. You yeah. can see it at the very very top where it's split up on the sure. door frame right there, but mm -hmm. other than that, you can't really tell. You have to walk up to it, and see. That's. Uh, I've seen that hanging in the crocker and I would have ne I've walked by it and never thought that it was two canvases. I mean, that's just astonishing. It is. It's quite, it's quite lovely. It's, it's quite a, it's quite a stunning piece. All right. So if we have anybody comments, we're going to go to this one. This one um, is called, of all things, Pacific Ocean. And uh, it's done by an artist named Jennifer Bartlett. And she graduated from Mills College. And like most artists, she began forging her own path. But at the time when she graduated, it was the minimalist art movement. So that it, paintings and the artwork were very spare and stripped down to its essentials, like uh, the ge uh, geo uh, geometric minimalists of, of Mondrian or uh, Frank Stella, who, who May not, you may not recognize his name, but you would recognize where it's just stripes. He does stripes, stripes, stripes. Um, she began painting one foot squares of um, cut steel on a large grid. And then after several years of trying to do this minimalist work, she decided this wasn't her voice at all. And by the 1980s, she shifted to these depictions of realistic scenes based on her photographic images. And again, she also took photographs. Um, this piece, the Pacific Ocean, is huge. It's 30 feet long and eight feet high. And it projects this amazing photorealistic illusion. Uh, it takes up one whole wall in the crocker. Uh, you can walk right by it because of where it's situated, but once you see it, you become mesmerized by it. Um, Bartlett was interesting. She, she considered such painting twice removed from reality. She said the first was being the act of the, pho the photograph and the second painting was from the reproduction of the photograph. And as I said, you know, when you stand in front of this and you look at it, you, you're, you are drawn into this ocean. You focus on these eddies and swirl, swirls on the beach and when you stand there, it, it's a very interesting optical illusion feeling and you become somewhat unbalanced. You almost feel like the ocean is moving and, you, and you're, standing, you're standing there. Um, the, the, the depth is somewhat flattened, so the viewer of up and down is also distorted. If you step inward, it's abstract. Once you step back, it's the Pacific Ocean. So. Um, they, they, they eventually, when everything gets back to a regular um, museum, they'll put a, a viewing bench in front of that again. And I've, I can tell you, I've sat there for quite a long time looking at, looking at this piece. And again, it is, is that an oil or acrylic? It's, um, you know, I believe this one is an oil and it's on a single canvas. So uh, it's, uh, it, it is another jewel also. 
but even looking at it in this small piece, you, you, you're you just drawn into, I, I am, I can only speak for myself, you're drawn into this, um, the color of the sand and the gentle waves breaking and this this blue, this this blue, it just, you look at it long enough and, and it you feel like it's moving. Well, and then the waves that are cresting, kind of beginning to crest way out on the horizon that are coming in. It's yes, exactly. All right, so we've talked about photorealism. Let's move into feminism, feminist art. And many of you might recognize this piece. This is um, Judy Chicago. And the feminist movement emerged in the late 60s, and it was admit so anti-war protests and a growing call for equality in demands for civil, gay, and, and women's rights. The uh, feminist artists uh, look to transform these stereotypes. You know, um, they they want they wanted to make the viewer question the social and the political landscape, and they wanted to incite change. They adopted very non-traditional media's. They used fabric. Um, they used fiber. They used performance art. They video. Um, they used alternative venues to kind of begin to revolutionize thinking about female art and artists. So one of the groundbreaking figures in contemporary American art is the artist and feminist Judy Chicago. And she produces very thought-provoking, very passionate, and at times controversial work. Um, she is unapologetic and unrestrained by her medium. Her work includes China and acrylic painting to cast glass and printmaking and textiles. And her most favorite, famous project, which we see here, is The Dinner Party. And that was through 1974 through 1979 that she took to do this. And it pretty much catapulted her onto the international stage. The original Dinner Party's initial opening was in San Francisco in 1979, and it drew enormous crowds. And it, in a way, brought the power to women's voices to the forefront of contemporary art. She stated that the purpose of the work of the dinner party was meant to um, end the ongoing cycle of admission in which women were written out of the historical record. So the dinner party, as we see here, comprises a massive ceremonial banquet. It's arranged as a triangular table. It measures 48 feet on each side with a total of 39 place settings and each of these place settings commemorate an important woman in history and the settings consist of embroidered um, runners um, gold chalices utensils and china painted porcelain plates with uh, raised central motifs that are based on uh, women's genitalia and butterfly forms and they're um, rendered in the styles that were appropriate to the women being honored. So she says that it, it uh, elevates the women achievement in Western history to a heroic scale that was traditionally reserved for men. And in the front, and, and these tables sit on tiles that you can see this white and the little scribbly that you see, those are the names of another 999 women they're inscribed in gold on the white tile floor um, that honor those women also. So there's more than a thousand names of, of women, historical women. Um, it, uh, um, and the, I want to go to the next one, Claudia. I was only going to say, Suzanne, that you also added that she did everything on that table. The, the um, runners, everything was part of the art piece. Art piece, and she designed it. She did have a little bit of help. It was kind of a collaborative. She did have some help with the weaving and sometimes the painting or the embroidery, but all the design was definitely hers. And I want to talk about this piece. This is the Hatshepsut plate. And this is a plate that's the test plate for the, for the one that was in the uh, uh, exhibit or the installation, and this is a Crocker, the Crocker piece. And um, 
the uh, the Hepshepsut plate is the first at the dinner party to have a raised relief surface, and it symbolizes that authority of Hatshepsut, who was the woman pharaoh, and she was very powerful um, and probably one of the most renowned female pharaohs. Uh, it it this design, and you can't quite see it here uh, because you're only getting a one dimensional but or two dimensional but it does have a um it mirrors the egyptian low relief uh which was a popular and really important method of sculpting during the dynastic period in which the figures kind of protrude slightly on the surface and they create a contour and this and 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 this visibility um in keeping with that tradition, the um, the center of the plate is only slightly, slightly raised. And according to Chicago, this place setting represents the transition from the flat plates in the dinner party to the three-dimensional ones. Um, the plates blue and red tones recall the colors that were often seen in Egypt, uh, the tomb paintings in relief. Uh, it also, the shapes, also suggest Egyptian hairstyles and the headdresses and the pharaohic uh, uh, collars. And um, in an ancient Egypt, the blue-green was an important color, were important colors. They are associated with the deities and rulers who wore that color and was visibly connected themselves to the gods and goddesses. So the, the, this whole place setting uh, is, is absolutely phenomenal. We don't have the uh, table runner or the chalice or the silver or the utensils but we do have the test plate for this particular piece um there was there's a lot more that that um these symbols uh the, the on the front of this uh runner the 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 hieroglyphics uh they're embroidered symbols that suggesting the phrase um, well-doing goddess, just Pharaoh of Egypt. So it's a great celebration piece. Any any questions on this? And anybody remember? Anybody rem you all must remember Judy Chicago. That this this was so controversial at the I, time. I saw this um, at the time when it was done. And what's funny is that even though I have such a textile background, I don't remember paying that much attention to the. Um, to the fabric part of it but the plates were what i think got a lot of attention at the time yeah they, you're right they they did but but the the fabrics are equally as as uh artistic and as beautiful and as thoughtfully rendered as the plates yeah i agree i'd like to see it again i would too i wish they'd bring it back my understand i could be wrong in this i thought there it's it's in a permanent home in brooklyn museum but i I may be totally wrong no, on let's that. Go. <laughs> what? Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Google. Go, Doctor no. Google. Go, Doctor Google. Let's find out. No, that's. Yeah. Right. I already looked it up. That's right. It's. On it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. So yeah. Hey, New York. Five hours I by plane. Let's go. <laughs> I saw. I saw it there. <laughs> you saw it in New York in Brooklyn when you were there. In Brooklyn. It's there permanently, like they said. I saw it there few years ago yeah and I also saw it in San Francisco but it's, it, it has its own room and everything and right and, and it's my understanding that it's kind of blacked out and the only illumination is on the table and the tiles so you really don't there's no other illumination is that correct you know I don't remember that because uh, okay. it's a huge room yeah anyway yeah. anybody else have any questions or comments Can we go to our next one I guess yeah. there really are, are women who haven't been uh, honored. I didn't realize there were female pharaohs. Yes, uh, Nefertiti uh, was okay. one. And yeah. uh, there's others, the names I can't pronounce, but uh, a lot of them were regents for their, for their son until the son became of age. But uh, um, um, Hatshepsut, uh, ruled for a long time. I, I, I think she pretty much kept her son in the background. So, <laughs> all right, Pam, you're going to recognize our, our friend here. This is um, Richard Jackson. He's a local guy and uh, it's an art installation 
or action art or pop art or you know you can fill in the blank on what richard jackson does he was influenced by surprise surprise abstract impressionism and action painting um he jackson pollock one of his who you did those drip paintings was one of his heroes and he said that's how he got interested in art because he saw this film of Jackson Pollock making a painting outside and he just decided that wow this is really great and he put he, Jackson Pollock puts on these old shoes and starts making a painting and he was intrigued by the activity because he liked the physical part of the whole thing as I said he's a native Sacramentan and he really combines a sense of humor and wit and occasionally phallic uh, to all his installations. He calls them alleged, alleged paintings, alleged art. He studied art and engineering at Sac State and he taught sculpture at UCLA. And he, because of his engineering background, he uh, meticulously engineers the sculptural machines that he activates and that they cause great um, eruptions of paint and spurts and splatters and smears and spray paint on gallery walls and the and the floors and um, uh, this one is called little girl's room and it is huge it, it actually took up a whole room at the crocker and uh, this little red-headed girl smiles and she lovingly clutches an upside down pink unicorn and is spinning on top of a platform so that was that was spinning around uh the room's filled with other items including a giant baby bottle a stuffed clown a jack-in-the-box in the corner and frankly the unicorn has uh, marked its territory by spraying everything with primary colors um, this installation actually was is a um, a traveling one, and it it uh, breaks down into very specific pieces. And uh, Pam and I were fortunate to see a uh, a, a video that uh, one of the people had taken, and they were showing how they had to bring this particular installation into the Crocker. In fact, his whole exhibit he. And uh, several years ago, there was a whole exhibit by uh, Richard Jackson. And uh, uh, this was just one part of it, but it was painstaking. And these pieces are huge. And uh, um, I don't know how they did it, but they, but they did it. So let's go to the next one, Pam. Dan, if I can, this is Pam, sure. if I can add something, not only is he from Sacramento, but I think it it was somewhere up in Yuba County, wasn't it, Suzanne, where he has a ranch and he's a, a rancher. And one of the pieces that was with this exhibit, um, you all know what pontalism or pointillism is, where the, they use little tiny dots. He used a gun, a rifle a, to shoot paint on to make his pointillism. So that was his homage, if you will, to his duck hunting i think yeah, duck hunting. he was a, he's a big duck hunter and you're right pam he though he lives in la uh most of the time he does have a ranch in in that area and he goes there frequently and i guess shoots ducks i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so this one i had the pleasure of watching him put this particular part of it uh together the um richard uh, jackson is the gentleman on the uh, bottom left and he is preparing one of the canvases and uh, on the the piece on the right are two of the cir half circles that he had finished preparing now how he does that as you see he's pouring the paint on he positions the canvas on the wall and then he turns it uh, 90 degree uh, sorry 180 degrees smearing the paint on the wall and then he will then position the canvas somewhere on that wall and the finished piece you can see is um on the uh on the on the wall and the reason we were at, we were not usually we're not allowed to go into the rooms when they're putting new exhibits on but this one was right outside the elevator on the third floor at the crocker and i happened to be over there uh it, late afternoon and uh they were working on putting on doing this particular this particular installation and uh 
is a very charming man, has a great sense of humor. And as I told Claudia earlier, um, we, I was standing there looking at his, he had a lot of assistants helping and uh, um, standing there looking at, at, at the piece. And this, I, uh, this person stands next to me and says, so well, what do you think of it? And I said, I don't think it's finished. And I turn around and it's him. And he says, well, you're right, it's not. And so, uh, you know, it's just, it, it wasn't the piece, it's not a piece of art that, you know, draws me in or attracts me but the more it's fascinating on how he does it but and as we said we go back to what the contemporary you're not celebrating the artist you're celebrating you're you're celebrating the emotion that's with it you're celebrating um perhaps the medium on on what the artist is doing or the thought behind it so, is it still there no this is one that most of his installations that's it you know he does these and the uh canvases come down and the walls painted over for how long was it, was it how, how long was it there several months oh okay okay yeah. it was there for <laughs> yeah it, the, most of the exhibits stay for several several months and this was in i believe 2019 and it stayed i think four months it, it was there what and are those uh trays, suzanne beg your pardon catherine what are those trays those it's like the back of canvases. Those are the those are the canvases, Catherine. Those are the back sides of the canvas. As you can see on the bottom left, Richard, where he's he's repairing the front part of the canvas with the with the paints, he slaps that up there and then he twists it 180 degrees and it smears into that um that semicircle. So that's what you're getting. You know those remember those Remember those machines you had and you get them at the fairs or yeah. something like that? You stick the, your paper in and then it whirls around and then you drop yeah. your colors in and it makes us. It's kind of like what he's doing there. So he kind of decides, um, puts the colors together and then he, then the paint lets the paint of the canvas on the front of the canvas dry onto the wall. And what you're seeing is the back part of the canvas. And that's the installation. So down here in the corner, he's putting the paint on, and that's the front side of what we're seeing here as the back side. Right, right. And um, there's a, a kind of a form that goes underneath there, the little wooden things that hold it up until the canvas dries onto the, onto the wall. So, but we did get something from Richard Jackson and that's Big Girl. This was in the show and the Crocker uh, purchased it. And now it is in one of our contemporary galleries and it is quite large. It's 11 feet tall and about four feet wide and it's aluminum. And it's, it's just fun. It's really fun. Uh, the kids love it. Um, he has kind of, uh, reminds me, this kind of piece is reminding me a lot of uh, Jeff Koons, you know, the, the yeah. balloon art. Um, but uh, he, he's very interesting, very eccentric artist and uh, just continues to experiment all the time. So, all right. Now, I think where we'd like to go is an area that I, we call social activism or commentary. And it, it's a lot of different styles, but what it, what it has in common is this social active uh, political element. And, uh, you know, Amanda Gorman, who was the poet laureate at uh, Joe Biden's presidential inaugural this year, said that the intersection of art and politics are inseparable. She said, she says sometimes um, she's told, oh, Amanda, we love your poetry. We'd love you to write a poem about this subject, but don't make it political. And she said that doesn't make any sense to her because all art is political. The decision to create, the artistic choice to have a voice, the choice to be heard is the most political act of all. So Protests, activism, or social movement art is art that just doesn't grab you. It's art that sends a powerful message. It makes a statement and resonates. Uh, many times it makes the viewer uncomfortable or sad. Uh, there's always an emotion associated. 
And, you know, it, it makes the viewer think. And just like art is supposed to do, it does elicit an emotion. And art is and always will be the language of the people. So this piece is by Art Farrow. It's called Bombed Mosque. And it's an anti-war statement. Uh, it's constructed of more than 50,000 bullets and shell cartridges and weighs about 780 pounds. And it was included in the um, artist's 2015 solo exhibit at the Crocker. Um, and it deals specifically with acts of terrorism in Pakistan that were targeting Shiite mosque. And while the front of the mosque, which is the opposite of this one, you see um, is completed and balanced, the rear reveals a gaping hole. And um, other sculptures by Pharaoh depict synagogues and other places of worship. And he says it's not to malign any single belief, but to be mindful and probing and tolerant of all. What I find interesting and why he went to this particular medium was that he was in, he was in Italy and he toured a crypt of a church in, of San Lorenzo in Florence. And it was a display of shrines, and they were all gleaming surfaces and ornate metalwork. And they that captured his imagination. So he was he was really taken and 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 shocked by one particular vessel, and that had the bones of a single uh, finger where it was suspended. So he came back home to San Rafael, and then he reflected on this experience. And then it resulted in this whole new work, quite different than his earlier cast bronzes, which he would do. Uh, he said he always uh, invested his art with social critique, but he said that something clicked when I started using real guns and bullets. Yeah, I, I bet. Um, anyway, uh, his studio is filled with guns and ammunition parts, and he, and he, um, uh, he just uses a lot of the arms manufactured in the 20th century uh, and he makes very distinctive uh, architectural features such as flying buttresses and arched windows and minarets and he combines uzis and copper bullets and brass casings and steel shot and you know the viewer kind of i i can only say that when i saw this i really got a jolt when I didn't realize it was far away in the room and I walked up. I didn't realize that bullets and guns, they were so ingeniously used that I, I was very shocked by that. And I started looking very closely. It's incredibly detailed, detailed work and beautifully rendered. Um, he builds the entire, um, the entire uh, piece that he's working on complete and then he explodes it from the inside out to me. So that's where you get this destruction. Wow. And it's, it's very powerful. Right now, there's also a piece of the Crocker called the White House. And that's also done with uh, um, ammunition and bullets. Yeah, I've seen a few of his pieces there. Did, they, you, did you say they had a special showing? He did in, in 2015. They, he oh. had his uh, an own show there. And yeah. there, there are, we have this piece now, and then we also have uh, the White House is on display in another room. A very good use of guns and ammunition. Basically, yeah, yeah exactly. All right. Moving on, I went, this is, this is, um, I mean, there's little I can add to this artwork. It's a red, very brilliant red background with the word breathe on it. And the name of it is Breathe, I Can't. And this was done by Willie Little in 2015. And he was, Willie Little is an artist born in North Carolina, and he's focused his whole artistic career on topics such as social justice and Black Lives Matter as it ha and how, and, and, and he uses art, he said that helped him overcome the marginalization as a gay black man in the rural South. And he considers himself a storyteller. Um, most of his works are, are installations. So they're sculptures or paintings or 
sound installations or reconstructed architecture, vignettes or recycled memorabilia. Um, and he infuses them all with real life stories. Um, this particular abstract piece, and he's done several with this type of background and it reflects the theme of rust and decay, which is a common thread in all his work. And it mirrors the physical and the uh, social decay in American culture. And uh, the interesting thing about the slogan associated with the Black Lives Matter movement actually originates from the last words of Eric Gardner, an unarmed man who was killed in 2014 after being put in a chokehold by a New York police officer. I can't breathe is what he said, I can't breathe. And it became 2014's most notable quote, but it faded from public consciousness again until the 2020 murder of uh, George Floyd. So, um, you know, as we, we, we talked about, it, it's just, there's a lot of emotion and feelings when you see a lot of social and activist art this way. All right, let's go to our next one, Claudia. Oh, I'm sorry, Melissa. But it's oil and wax. Yeah, he does uh, multiple, he uses different types of mediums. So he'll wax something on it, which will um, uh, start, stop an area when you paint over it and then he'll pull the wax off that gives of it a different look. So it, it has this almost interesting batik, kind of batik look or old, it, it reminds me more of old rusted metal is, is, is what it begins to look like. And that's the illusion. He said there was a lot of rusted metal in the South growing up and that's his heritage. That's, that's his story. And uh, um, he kind of infuses that into most of his pieces. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, let's, uh, I want to talk about this next piece on more cultural identity, whoops, cultural identity um, and, and awareness. And this one is um, called Coyote and Crow, and it's by a Native American artist named Rick Bartow. And two years ago, the Crocker hosted the American Indian Art and Activism exhibit called When I Remember, I See Red. And this, this exhibit, you know, a, a display of artwork explored the American Indian experience and the activism that characterized um, a generation of Native artists. And some of the artists created and restored aspects of ceremony or their language and their art and others dedicated themselves to passing on the Native philosophy and culture to the next generation through their art. And then some geared their work to bring broader awareness of indigenous issues and, and working for more positive political change. But in the dozens of pieces in the show, this one resonated with me most. And I think it's because of the artist, when you hear, know the backstory of this, exposed a very deeply personal part of him, is of loss and recovery, and one that is very culturally relevant. Um, Rick Bartow uh, uh, served in the Vietnam War and he returned to the coastal Oregon with PTSD and as an alcoholic. So after a period of recovery and working on it, he turned to art as a way to heal and connect with his um, Native American heritage through the stories of his childhood. Uh, making art allowed him to confront the parts of his history that were very difficult. And while, you know, he avoided depicting specific wartime experiences, his, his work came to feature these haunting combinations of human form and animal forms seemingly caught in the act of transformation, which is what his, his native culture, uh, celebrates and also how he felt that he was transforming too. Um, late in life he became involved in the world renewal ceremonies of his ancestral community of the Mad River uh, band Wyatt people of Rica, California and that played a big role also in connecting with uh, many of the um, tribal symbols and figures. So this particular piece um, 
he drew, you know, inspiration from Native American stories, most notable the creation stories about shape-shifting animals. They were meant to remind us that uh, every living thing is connected. And uh, the coyote and crow depicts a long-legged, uh, kind of a humanoid bird, and then the interconnected forms of a coyote and human figure. And Bartow kind of uh, reminds the viewer that um, Native American animal stories often include um, insights about human behavior, uh, and and they they tell the, and they're told through the exploits of the animals, and sometimes feature very dramatic visions of shape shifting transformation. So, um, anybody have an idea or want to take a stab at what what the symbolism? Of the, of the spirit animals. And remember, spirit animals choose you. You don't choose a spirit animal, they, they choose you. And it doesn't mean that you become that animal, it becomes that sometimes you, you embody the behavior of that animal. So anybody wanna take a stab at what a coyote kind of symbolizes? No one? <laughs> Sorry. Aren't they well, wily? Aren't they wily um, tricksters? Yes, they're jokesters and tricksters. Anything else? They um, they are also associated with a deep magic of life and creation. They can all symbolize adaptability, which a coyote has done incredibly well, given that uh, urban urban construction has encroached on their natural habitat. They are a teacher of wisdom and um, they can also at times reveal the truth behind illusion and chaos. Um, they, there's this spirit animal kind of reminds you not to take life too seriously. It's just like and bring more balance between the wisdom and playfulness. So that was an important part. You'll see coyotes in a lot of Rick Bartow's work. Now, what about the crow? Anybody want to take a stab at the crow? That's wisdom and intelligence. Yep. Wisdom and intelligence. Anything else? Odd, because they're not particularly a pleasant bird, but... They, they, they are not, but they are associated with, uh, this, with, with life mysteries and magic and luck, and they can provide insight. But you're right, they're intelligent, they're fearless, um, they also, depending on the culture, can um, they, they symbolize the void or the core of creation. So he's put all these symbols together in transforming from all these things, from man, man transforming into animal, or animal transforming into man. So, any questions on this? But this is a this is also a. a, a absolutely stunning piece to stand and and look at and and uh uh kind of figure out what is what is transforming here all right so let's go to our next any questions or comments okay let's go to our next one what the heck is an nft well, you've probably been reading a lot about an NFT in the papers these days or on the news, a non-fungible token asset. It's a, it's a digital piece of art. And um, they're, they're uh, these digital assets uh, that are usually computer generated. They're images or GIFs or JPEGs or songs or videos. And uh, NTFs are, they make this digital artwork unique. Oh, sorry. Okay. There we go. Um, okay. Gotta be careful with my fingers here. And then, of course, because everything has a price on it, these are becoming sellable. And the technology for NTFs has been around since the mid. 20, 2010s, but it hit the mainstream in the late 2017 with CryptoKitties. I don't know if you ever remember CryptoKitties. Melissa, you love cats. You should know CryptoKitties. Yeah. It's a site that allowed people to buy and breed limited edition digital cats with cryptocurrency. 
So yeah, so people are making fungible items out of the non-fungible. Exactly. Well, this particular JPEG, which is a file, uh, was done by the digital artist Mike Winkleman. He's also known as Beeple. <laughs> and it just sold for record breaking $69.3 million. Oh my goodness. And it's the third highest price achieved by a living, a living artist. Third wow. highest price. It's called Every Days. It's the first 5,000 days. It's a collage of all the images this guy that Beeple posted online each day since 2017. Hmm. So, uh, it's, it's a new art form. I don't think the Crocker has acquired any, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, and they certainly haven't acquired if they had 69, $63 million or $69 million to spend. I don't necessarily know they would spend it on an NTF, NFT, excuse me. So it's actually a stunning piece. Um, in total, if you see on the left-hand side, and then there's a small one of, one of the, one of the, pieces of it is on the right hand side and he created all those so it's um it's we're gonna have to see how these uh these particular pieces move forward and yeah. uh, someone says do you own own these pictures well you own them and because they use what they call blockchain technology it's a network of computers that records these transition and gives buyers a proof of authenticity and ownership doesn't mean that you they're they're not going to be on the uh, they're still going to not going to be put on the internet um uh, kind of like if if we were talking you know how at&t is now using the beatles songs or the stones songs so if this was ever used in a commercial endeavor then he would get credit for it but suzanne i'm sure you didn't pay for its use today. <laughs> nope, I didn't. It was pulled right off of a New York Times article. <laughs> so let them oh, deal with them. <laughs> I have to tell you, I have to tell you a little bit, a little bit about my sister Lillian. My sister Lillian has this app, it's called Each Day or something like that. So every day she puts in a photo and she's gone back, I don't, back to her birth, I think. And Lillian, you could do this. And it would be like 80 times 365. It would be a lot. It would be a lot. Uh -huh. <laughs> it would be. Go for it, Lil. I say go for it. <laughs> what is the app that you use, Lillian? What is that app? Day one. Day one. Day one. All right. Anyway, we just thought we'd do that. Now I'd kind of like to end up with urban art. Now the urban art or street art uh, combines street art, graffiti, and it's an umbrella phrase that kind of links all visual art forms in urban and public areas. Sometimes it's viewed as vandalism, but it's become an international art form and that's become mainstream. So artists like Banksy or Nick Gentry or Shepard Ferry, who, who actually designed the Obama Hope poster, and as you see here, the Johnny Cash that's on the far left on side, that's the Shepherd Ferry um, uh, artwork. Anyway, Sacramento has embraced this urban street art with a program called Wide Open Walls. And it has an international festival. Artists come from around the globe to produce their art uh, on, on spaces and alleyways and buildings and you know garages and it's all throughout the sacramento region currently there are uh more than 80 permanent works that bring the public art to 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 people and uh there's actually a map of all the artwork on the wide open walls website but there are some tremendous people and i know melissa you live downtown and there's artwork all around you in fact the garage that you live in has a wide open wall has an artist that yeah. picked up, uh, some murals there. Yeah, they just did murals a couple weeks ago. Yeah, and they're actually- I, I drive by the Johnny Cash all the time. Yeah, it's- And um, Donna Billick has done a bunch of the sides of buildings, like on the CVS building at 17th, it's ceramic tile. Mm -hmm. Do you remember oh. Donna? She lived out at Phil and Tosi's house. Remember Phil and Tosi, the cuckoo's Yeah, house? I do, yeah. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. 
but this art, you know, it's so amazing to watch them do that, this because it's, they're, they're done on scaffolding or these lifts yeah. and they're vision, these incredibly large pieces of artwork. And they, some, and some of them are just exquisite. I would say most of them are, or all of them are exquisite. They're just very, very different. So anyway, that's our tour today through um, contemporary. And I think I have one more, Claudia. There we go. So my question is, is it art? Like the Mutz cartoon. Look, Frank, the face of the Mona Lisa on a pizza. What do you think of that? Oh, you use too much pepperoni. Well, everybody's an art critic. <laughs> but, but what I love is what Groucho Marx said in the movie Animal Crackers. We must remember that art is art. Still, on the other hand, water is water, and east is east, and west is west, and if you take cranberries and stew them like applesauce, they taste much more like prunes than rhubarb does. So, <laughs> that's, that's contemporary art. <laughs> Anybody have any questions or comments? Or gonna uh, go, I'm going to mute everybody. On those, uh, uh, you're going to start bidding on your own uh, NFTs? That was a wonderful tour, Suzanne. Yeah, thank, thank you. Love. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we're kind of ready, Claudia, for oh, taking a deep breath and going into doing a nice little meditation. Well, I'm sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I talked a lot of work. You put a lot of work into that. Mute themselves. I'll move to the next slide. You probably weren't surprised to see this. So now we're going to move into our meditation and um, we'll use this painting by Jennifer Bartlett, The Pacific Ocean. I love this painting. I could so easily move myself into that space of watching the endless waves caress the shore. So let's use this image to move into that relaxed state as you sit comfortably and consciously relax your whole body. Maybe just give your shoulders a little shrug or two. You know, sometimes it feels like our shoulders carry the weight of the world on us. Some say it works best to lightly close your eyes shutting out any visual distractions and bringing your awareness inward. However, another quote, approach is just to soften your gaze and look at this piece of artwork. And just focus on it as you relax. As Suzanne said, maybe you'll focus on the foam or the depth Now take a deep breath in to a count of four or five. Hold. And then release your breath to a longer count of seven or eight. That's the exhale breath that relaxes our body. And another deep breath. Hold. And then a long, slow exhale. If you find your mind wandering during this meditation, it's okay. Just bring your focus back to your breath or gaze softly at the painting as you move yourself into that sacred place. We're often pulled in so many directions. We wear so many different hats. We do so much for so many people. But now, right now, I invite you to relax and remember who you are. Who you really are. As I read this poem by Cahill Cabron, the river cannot go back. It is said that before entering the sea, a river trembles with fear. She looks at, back at the path she has traveled, 
from the peaks of the mountains, a long winding road crossing forests and villages. And in front of her, she sees an ocean so vast that to enter, to enter there, there seems nothing more than to disappear forever. But there is no other way. The river cannot go back. Nobody can go back. To go back is impossible in existence. The river needs to take the risk of entering the ocean because only then will fear disappear because that's where the river will know. It's not about disappearing into the ocean, but of becoming the ocean. You are like the river, flowing into something bigger, something more powerful than you ever thought possible, more magnificent, more centered. Calm at the depth and the core of your being. The river needs to take the risk of entering the ocean because only then will fear disappear. And that's where the river will know it's not disappearing into the ocean, but becoming the ocean. You have faced challenges. You have surpassed what some thought you could ever achieve. You are an overcomer. With your next breath, breathe in tenderness and compassion. Breathe out love, gratitude, and appreciation. Again, breathe in tenderness and compassion for yourself. Breathe out love, gratitude, and appreciation for others. It's time to celebrate your true self. You are unique. You are like the wave that comes to shore, expressing the beauty and the power of the ocean. Here's a quote that I like. We are to God as the wave is to the ocean. The wave is not the magnitude of the ocean. However, it has all the elements contained in the ocean. We are not as expansive as God. However, we have all the attributes of God. Namaste, my friends. Namaste. And now I invite you to gently bring yourself back into our space. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to turn things back over to Suzanne because I know she has one more thing to show us and say. So um, open up your mics and here we go. Well, first I have to thank you all for coming this, yeah, I, and, and supporting us. I have, I have so enjoyed doing this for, for my, my, I do this for myself and I'm glad you're along on the journey with me. Um, I want to, um, there's two books that I thought maybe you might enjoy reading and I certainly did. Although they focus on modern art, they do move all, also in contemporary. One is called Why a Painting is Like a Pizza and that's by uh, Nancy um, uh, Heller. 
And the other is why your five-year-old could not have done that. <laughs> and and uh, truly, they, you, yeah, uh, tr it, it takes a lot. That's by Susie Hodge. So, and then the other, the third resource you might want is that um, the Sacramento Urban Art Mural Tour is on um, Wide Open Walls, all the uh, wideopenwalls.com. You can go there and you can look at the artists, you can look at the art, you can plot your own walking map of the different areas and um, take some time to do that. And that would be a wonderful Sunday afternoon trip just to walk around and, and do that or even bike, bring your bikes down and bike around. So again, I really appreciate, I'm, I'm so thankful that all of you come and join us and uh, are patient and tolerant as we go through this. Uh, and well, thank um, you. That's wonderful. Oh, you're more than welcome. My pleasure. And um, next month, I want to just say that the Crocker is open and they have a Tiffany exhibit coming. And Ooh. that's supposed to be spectacular. 